Welcome to the Recess Life Podcast. This is the place where we explore play and what it means to get back to your inner child. I'm Louise, your host. Join me as I chat with teachers, entrepreneurs, artists, and thought leaders about how we can live a life of more play and impact. Let's get it started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of the Recess Life Podcast. I have another in-person guest today. We have Adam Rosendahl, and he is the founder and CEO of Late Night Art, and you're going to hear all about what that is and to hear how he arrived at the work that he does that impacts so many organizations today. Um, So give us just a quick synopsis of what Late Night Art is, and then of course, we'll go back in time and hear about how you created it. Sure, okay. So late night art, um, what we do is we have a team of facilitators that go around into companies, teams, and conferences, and we host this uh, 90 minute training or workshop that's really focused around bringing out people's imagination and connecting them more deeply and meaningfully to each other. Um, We use art supplies and music and facilitated conversations to bring people out of their roles and create a more human culture inside of workplace environments. So um, the workshop is very um, flexible and we work with uh, quite a unusual range of clients from like scientists uh, in quantum computing to probation officers to, you know, professors. um, And we found that this is just kind of a a surprising and really effective way of getting people out of their normal way of relating to each other Mm. and relating to the work and the problems that they're currently grappling with and just creating like a fresh new um new it really like it's kind of like a restart Mm -hmm. and it just creates a new way of relating and interacting and addressing so um yeah. takes people out of their their day-to-day and into kind of a special um, new space. Yeah, the box that they've put themselves in, maybe in, within their company or their organization, and allows them to pull back and connect with each other again. Yeah, and it's through yeah. these series of, like, of ingredients, including getting people's hands dirty with art supplies, having great uh, soundtracks of music that control the environment, and then creating these facilitated ways of interacting and all of these together mm-hmm. help people bring them into a new space. Yeah. And you've done this with groups of all sizes and backgrounds. And why do you think this has been effective for for those groups in such diff- with such different varieties of backgrounds? Because it seems like, oh, probation officers and scientists and um, developers, they don't have uh, they don't have much in common, but how but this workshop or th- what you do sounds like it resonates with all of them. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I, I've i found that it doesn't really matter what someone's background is, um, whether we're working with um, a small startup in Bangalore, India, or um, a group of, like I said, scientists from Germany, or a group of you know 19-year-old college students at Stanford. <laughs> There's... There, through this process, we're able to bring people back um, in some ways into a little bit more of their childlike self or their beginner's mind. Um, and using the arts uh, it is sort of an equalizer that brings out people's humanity and also kind of eliminates the hierarchy that exists between people mm-hmm. um, or the way that they judge people based on how they look or the role that they play um, and has been really effective in just kind of creating a, like I said, a really unique and new way to relate with each other. Mm. Yeah, what you just said about relating back to your childlike self. I mean, before we were technologists or developers or, you know, whatever occupation we sort of identify ourselves as, we were all at one point kids and we were all at one point um, running around at recess with our, with our fellow friends and it didn't sort of matter what our roles were and um, what box we were in because we didn't really have those definitions when we were younger. And then I think as we grow up, we sort of start to compartmentalize ourselves and 
lose that connection with each other. Yeah, I mean, especially if you think about inside of large companies and the relationship between uh, an executive and an intern. Yeah. Or in, in with, within Stanford, for instance, and the relationship between a professor and a student, mm -hmm. there is a very <clears throat> distinct difference in the way that people relate to each other. And so what I love about late night art is it puts people on the same playing field. So, yeah. you know, a 20 year old intern can be interacting with the CEO of their comp of a, a thousand person company um, and have them be equals mm -hmm. and not have that kind of like charged um, hierarchical mm. like power structure sure to be able to eliminate that i think is a really beautiful part of what we do mm, yes putting everyone in this on the same playing field all is equals equals to each other yeah and there's something also about being able to um, melt stereotypes and judgments that we have about each other mm -hmm. that we've built up based on like our really limited way of knowing each other which is usually like such a small percentage of who we are yeah and how we show up so yeah oh Amazing. I definitely want to get back into what you do at Late Night Art, but before we do that, I want to hear a little bit more about your background, how you arrived here, uh, because I'm sure it, this idea didn't just pop up out of thin air one day. There was probably a, a series of events from your life and childhood that arrived you here. Um, but yeah, first of all, you, um, you grew up in the, um, the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And was art always a big part of your life and creativity, or um, what were some of those um, experiences that that sparked that in you? I mean, I don't remember this, but my mom describes uh, me growing up in Berkeley and sending me to the Berkeley Art School when I was two years old, which apparently was me going to this place where um, there would be all these tiny little kids, and they would give us jugs of paint, and we would just like huck paint on the wall what? And, and, have, <laughs> and come home completely covered in different colored acrylic paints at, t at how old two years old at two years old oh yeah. my gosh i don't even want to imagine what a bunch of two-year-olds and paint so, would do and it was it was actually wow. they had child psychologists who were actually analyzing like the way that adam is throwing paint on the wall is kind of <laughs> expressing you know his his enthusiasm whatever oh my gosh um, he has this inner angst or this <laughs> this specific quality that we've noticed in the way that he <laughs> flings that paint against the wall but i actually love <laughs> imagining that part of myself you know like uh. the like wild eyed like throwing a bucket of red on a huge white wall oh my god and just like laughing oh of course <laughs> <laughs> yeah. wow with a bunch of other kids so you actually you, you specifically even remember that as a two-year-old i no, i don't remember oh you don't remember that okay i, have, I'm I, like, have, I don't I have, remember that as, i, I don't have photos and you know i have a lot of photos um of myself creating art when i was very very little had a little canvas and everything so yeah my mm. mom didn't consider herself an artist and she had a really strong desire to put me into art classes and um, have me be an artist and a creative person. Uh, but she herself didn't feel like she was an artist. And so she wanted to cultivate that in you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, and I, I think that's a funny conversation in of itself, how we put ourselves in that category of artist or not artist, um, and how we cope with that. And for her coping with it was helping you to become an artist. Yeah. Um, fascinating. Yeah. And it's funny now cause now I feel like I'm, I'm a big support in bringing out her like the different creative mm. elements of her and helping her use the arts in her work as a consultant yeah um, and so that's uh, it's kind of this fun exchange you know does she identify as an artist now would you say or is she is she getting there i still mm. i think the art the word artist is very charged and so for me it's for like sure. it's like less important but what she's doing is she's gotten really into mosaics and so she's mm. like diving into this really interesting art form, mm -hmm. mosaics, salsa dancing. Mm. So yeah, I think she's, she's creating a life that is more in touch with the arts right now. Oh, that, that makes me really happy. Yeah. Oh, um, so starting from the time you were two years old, flinging paint at the wall, um, how, how did that, that progress, um, throughout the rest of your childhood and the rest of your adult, young adult life? I always identified as an artist and you know went to I studied like a variety of art forms when I was young and then when I was in college I studied art um mm. at UC Santa Cruz and so that was kind of a thread always throughout my life um yeah figuring out how to do art with other people that was kind of a unique element was like I loved creating art with people so I remember mm. even in high school um 
and then in college, like g- gathering groups of people to create art together more as a social activity and not mm-hmm. so much as a, not for the product, but mm-hmm. how to create environments where it was really fun for people. Yeah. The um, experience and the process of collaborating together was more important than actually, you know, whatever the end piece would be. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And especially adding music, creating environments where it was fun and it was exciting to create mm-hmm. instead of having it be a pressure. Mm-hmm. So. Was your medium always um, fine art or painting or what was your, what was your medium of choice? Uh, I mean, in high school and then going into college for six years, I painted murals. And so that okay. was acrylic paint. Um, yeah. Doing public art and murals inside of Sonoma County, which is where I, I moved to after the San Francisco Bay area. And so that, yeah, that became my, my main medium was acrylic paints, but yeah. In college, I studied printmaking, so I did a lot of woodcuts gotcha. and lithography and got really into illustration. Mm-hmm. Did you have a sort of end game in mind by being, by, with doing art? Because I know for me and a lot of the message that I, that you hear about art growing up is that art is what you do for fun and as a hobby. And eventually it, it, you, it can't sustain you, so eventually you have to prioritize other things was that was that message ever downloaded to you in any way or was did or if it was did you just ignore it and say no i'm just gonna keep doing art yeah i mean i think that message is pretty strong in our culture generally yeah that was very prevalent for me in college studying studio art and having the voices of you know family friends Mm-hmm. Not so much my parents, but like people around me being like, you will be poor. You will live a life of poverty. Really? You know, get ready for it. You know, right. um, it's coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's just like a fact, you know, yeah. oh, this is your choice. Yeah. Okay. Good um, luck. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Good luck. And then, and it's like kind of like a, it's often accompanied with like sarcasm and mm-hmm. like a laugh. Mm. Like, a, like kind of funny, but it always felt like, like a stab for me. Mm. Like, oh, you're an artist that, okay. Yeah. My sort whole tone. Like, all my family never really kind of understood what I was doing or why or like where I would be going. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't either, you know. I your felt, extended family or your immediate family? No, my right? parents were very supportive. Okay. I mean, they didn't really know where I was going either. But mm-hmm. um, my extended family was very skeptical of my choices. Yeah. Yeah. But your your immediate family was always supportive of you and, you know, they they, they trusted that you would figure it out. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do have voices that, of that I can remember of, you know, oh, like what? It's like, oh, what are you studying? Studio art. It's like, ha 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 ha. <gasps> really? It's like, yeah. It's like, oh, have fun living a life of poverty. I remember one wow. person saying that to me, and it really to stung. your face. It's stung, yeah. But <gasps> it's at least have the decency to say it behind your back. It's, <laughs> yeah. I think that there was even even for me though, it's studying college. That, I had no idea where I was going with it, uh-huh. and so it didn't feel grounded. So I think there was a bit of angst throughout the whole process, but it, it always felt like if I tried to study anything else, it would be inauthentic. Mm, yeah. So you didn't have a, what the outcome was supposed to be, but you knew regardless you had to keep following this path because it was true to who you were. Yeah, yeah. Despite the voices of society, of people, of your family yeah, coming just, at you. You know, I tried to study psychology and environmental studies and it was just like a joke. To try to even go there. Yeah. Oh. And I, I I think it's not uncommon, unfortunately, for us to, as a culture, try to fit ourselves into a mold that we think will be more accepted or more looked positively upon by society. You know, I think that's actually more common than not. And I think it takes a lot. It takes something very strong within you to, to not fall into that. So congratulations on not doing that, uh, despite uh, the challenge. Not that it was easy, like you said. Yeah. But um, yeah. And so you, after college, was that where you decided to go to AmeriCorps or was that before? Yeah. I mean, I, after college, I moved from Santa Cruz to Berkeley and I had a variety, like a long string of jobs. Mm Mm-hmm which was about a year before I did AmeriCorps in Seattle. Okay, got it. And then um, what did you do while you were doing AmeriCorps? Um, Well, so when I was 13, Mm -hmm. I got sent up to this uh, youth arts camp um, 
it's and it doesn't feel quite right to call it a camp, okay. but it was a program that was based on Whidbey Island near Seattle. And so the program is, is about 50 teenagers who are coming from a really wide and diverse range of backgrounds who are um, representing a wide range of cultures. There's many youth who are coming from different Native American reservations mm. in the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's about half the youth are subsidized from foster care. And so we enter into this kind of forest where none of us know each other. We don't know our backgrounds. And there's about 25 adults who are activists and different artists from different uh, disciplines. And so over the course of about eight days, there's two lead facilitators who lead this group of about 75 um, teenagers and adults through this really deep arts based process of connection and kind of uncovering our stories and our identity. And over the course of that, I, I felt like I had developed like a new, new brothers and sisters and like a new sense of kind of family Hmm. that in some ways I feel like that's what it kind of cracked my heart open to like what other people's life experience was like. Um, but also when I got home, I realized that I would, I just wanted to have deeper relationships in my life. Um, I realized that the place that I lived was very homogenous and that became extremely clear, like coming back from this camp. Wow. Um, and then I also was kind of blown away by the power of these two facilitators who led us through this process over eight days that connected us in such deep ways that I felt like I knew these people better than I knew my, my friends and my family. So that really changed me in terms of like my trajectory and what I was, where my mind was at. Yeah. Your eyes were wide open after B- that, huh? Big time. And the campus yeah. called um, The Power of Hope. The Power of Hope. Okay. Yeah. Is and it still so, going on today? Yeah, yeah. But Maybe. So I kept going back to that camp like year after year. Um, and then uh, I decided to work for them as an AmeriCorps member when I graduated college. So I was in a facilitator role, but only for a, a small portion. And then most of the time I was actually working in the office. Got it. Okay. And what was that? What was that like? Because uh, that was how long is the AmeriCorps program? It was one year. One year. Cool. Yeah. It was it was rough because mm-hmm. I um, I had such uh, a passion for this organization, and after being there from thirteen through nineteen, and then all of a sudden at twenty going to work for them, uh, I thought this was a dream come true. But when I got to the office, I realized that. Um, very few other people inside of the organization at this time <clears throat> had the same kind of magic quality and relationship to the work that we were doing. So it really was more like an office job. Mm, the behind the scenes yeah. stuff, right? So yeah. in some ways I could say it was like, um, it was it was really hard for me to feel like expressed or I didn't feel like I was surrounded by the magic that I was imagining I would be put into. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that create more of a fire in you to decide, okay, th- I want to be a part of the magic even more now because I'm not getting to, ex- to experience that here. I mean, it almost mm. like pushed me out, but then I persevered. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I almost pushed you out of the program. Like it just, okay. it just being on the administrative side of this, yeah. like it didn't, it didn't have the kind of satisfying quality that I had imagined it would. Sure. Um, but I'm very glad that I stayed. Yeah, good, good. Gosh, I almost feel like that would be a, a little bit of a crisis moment in it was, some ways. There was a was number it? of crisis moments. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like this this magical, you know, place that I knew and that I that I feel so connected to, and I feel like I'm, and then to kind of see the behind the scenes, then it come crashing down a little bit is, is what I feel like it would have been like. Yeah. In some ways, I mean, it's like real life. It's like it an, is, an, it? an administrative like aspect of running a program in a nonprofit is definitely not, you know, it's can be connected to the magic of the work itself, but mm-hmm. it enables the magic to happen in some ways. Sure. sure. Right. I, but <laughs> I, I, challenging I, yeah, yeah. to experience nonetheless. Um, but the program, mm-hmm. I mean, what's cool about the power of hope is that over Around that time, it started branching out into a um, an international organization. So it went from just being in um, Seattle. There was a branch and a sister organization that developed in Canada, and then Oregon, and then London, Uganda, and now it's it's in over fifteen countries. Oh, that's incredible! Incredible, and it, it was just the one location when you were a part of it. Yes. Wow, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, going back to that 
experience you had when you were 13, um, it, it cracked you open, like we said. And Totally. I think that, I mean, one, I saw two facilitators leading this program of 75 people, yep. and it actually felt like real magic. <laughs> like what they were doing was so foreign to me and so exciting that I, I decided that I want to do something like that pretty early on. Mm. Like two is, I think the, the depth of relationships that I felt, especially to like young people who had a completely different experience than me. I recognize like the value of diversity in a way of just mm -hmm. like how much we can learn from each other and what is lost in environments that don't have um, diversity or diverse like thought. Yeah. Um, and then, so like those two come, and then also like the third part of it was like the use of the arts as a tool for connection yeah. and not necessarily about creating a beautiful dance piece or a nice book or something. Um, it was really rooted in like, how can we use art and different creative modalities to help like eliminate the barriers that we have between each other. Mm -hmm. And so those three were like the drive and the inspiration for me to um, come back to the camp every single year. I mean, this this summer now, I'll have been involved in the program for 19 years. Oh, you're, so you're still a part of it today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. and I'm now I'm now a lead facilitator. Which oh. Is it so I'm, I'm I'm one of those circle. I'm one of those two yeah, those two people that's leading, you know, 25 to 30 staff and then 50 yeah. teenagers. Yeah. But you became what you dreamed about being very much, as a child. Very much, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I think I was I was just like, that was like my my light that I was drawn towards for a long time. It was like, how do I do something like this? How do I like bring this kind of feeling into my life? Mm -hmm. And I, it took me a long time to figure it out. But yeah, that's very much like the light and the inspiration behind late night art. Mm. It became sort of this guiding light for your for your path you yeah. didn't know how you were going to get there but you knew okay i I'm, I'm going towards that yeah exactly yeah yeah so um once you um once americorps was done um what was um, where did your path lead you there uh the last six months of that year-long program mm -hmm. i i had to fight hard to get into it but i was part of a, a program called the heart of facilitation mm -hmm. And this program was um, about a five-month program that was focused on um, facilitation skills. People call it grad school for facilitators. Hmm. And it was in this program that I actually um, created what was to become Late Night Art. Um, in the heart of facilitation, I met a friend, Julian Thomas, who lived in Vancouver, Canada. And he had this emphasis around meaningful dialogue and getting people to connect around meaningful questions and conversations. Mm -hmm. And so together we actually created the workshop that at that time we called it, um, I think it was called creative collaborations and we led it. That was my final project for this training. Um, so we led it for about 35 people and it was, um, at the end of it, there was like an old woman, this woman who was like 75, who was a writer. And she said she had never drawn or painted since she was a young girl. Hmm. Um, she, there was like a lot of, um, I don't know what, what stopped her, but there was hmm. like some kind of like barrier there, some wall that was up. And something that happened in our workshop just like let down that wall. And she was like, I'm, she realized that she loved painting with watercolors and she was going to buy her set the next day. Hmm. And she was crying, you know, at the end of the session, it was only like 90 minutes. And I realized like at that moment there was like, okay, this is really powerful mm -hmm. as a way to connect people with their own creativity. Yeah. There's something here. What happened was like, as I was doing this workshop, more and more people were going through it. And I lived in Oakland and I would start walking around and people, I could just see there's a little like twinkle in their eye when they're looking at me. And and more and more people that I met had been through my program. And so I started to become known as someone who was just doing really good things in the community, who was bringing people together, who was creating like a powerful platform for connection. Mm -hmm. And people started, I think, wanting to help me and like really like push me forward. Mm -hmm. And so I actually got taken under the wing of some um, like women who became mentors for me and like helped me like nurture the business, but also really identify that what I was doing was like a positive, 
like it's like a really really important and positive thing for the community in Oakland yeah um, in terms of bringing people unlikely groups of people together in a really deep way and so from that encouragement and like the the kind of uh, mentorship from some of these women who run an organization called Impact Hub Oakland mm-hmm. like that was really where I st- started to feel more confident to actually um, or I felt I felt like for the first time in my life, like I was a really important part of the community and my skills were like valid and valued. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it kind of created like a really strong source of, uh, like, I, I, like identity, like a big identity shift from being like taking up space to like really like being a powerful force for good. And so like, I think that identity shift was huge in terms of me, like, taking myself seriously and Mm -hmm. taking things to the next level gosh that's beautiful and i i think we all need those people in our life that really sees us right and that really sees the the potential of the impact that we can make and nurtures that within us we're a combination of the people around us that support us and and see who we can be so that's really cool yeah that's true Ah, that's really cool. Um, so when did you, was there a moment when you, where you experienced, hey, late night art actually could be a business that really sustains me and sustains others. Um, was there ever a moment that hit you or that has that, has there been a series of moments? I think that, I mean, in, I think it was 2014 where I thought I'm going to try to go full time with late night art. And then I went, you know, I, I left my job and I was full time for about a month and a half yeah. or two months before I realized, oh, this is actually, I can't do this right now. Mm. Um, I can't pay rent. And so I had to get another job for another year. So 2015, um, I got laid off from my that job. And I remember that was the moment. So it was definitely like kicked out of the nest. And I thought, oh no, I'm not going to be able to pay rent this month. Mm-hmm. And, um, in, I remember like crying and climbing this hill behind UC Berkeley <laughs> and like, <laughs> like calling like my, co- like my business coach at the time and being like, Oh, what am I going to do? And that next day I got, um, I got a gig from a consulting company where I was going to make, uh, the amount that I would have made in four months, like from this current job. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, first I felt like a wave of, I'm going to be okay. Whew. And then literally the next day I got my first corporate gig from like in the Bay area from old Navy and Uh, where I was going to again, make like four times as much as I would have made in one month at this, this past job. So all of a sudden I was going to be making $8,000 in like four days. Wow. And for me, like where I was making it less, like about a thousand dollars a month, Mm -hmm. like that was, that was a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think in that moment developed like the, this drive saying like, I'm going to be self-employed. I'm not going back. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to start running <laughs> and like, I'm keep, fully in keep, now. Keep yeah. my momentum. Yeah. Yeah. Keep, I'm um, just be all in, but how, but gosh, how easy it could have been for you at any point to still say, Oh, I, I should go back to something full time and a stability something stable that employs me and it's okay if you do I think I think we all have to do what we have to do um but uh but you decided I'm I'm all in yeah I'm going to make this work yep and do you think that do you think that mind shift in particular that that sort of commitment that all in commitment um and I've talked to other artists before where until they had that full committed mindset um things weren't flowing and they, they were sort of half in, half out. And because of that, things weren't coming to them. And for you, having that, in your experience, having that committed all-in mentality, did that change things? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I became, like, fiercely committed to making it work. And, and not just making it work, but being successful. And I think there's a lot that was driving me, you know, around, like, um, in some ways, it's like, there's, like, fear. Um, but I think it was more just wanting to be there's, there's a little bit of a, just like combating the voice of like the poor artist, um, and like just the getting by kind of, you know, ragged clothes, like quality, <laughs> like crazy artist like yeah. stereotype and just like 
what does it look like for me to actually like become an example for um, someone who's an artist who also creates a business that's successful that can employ other creative people? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. How can you live out that your your values of of being an artist and supporting yourself as an artist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have you when you do sort of fall into the those feelings of self doubt or you know, questioning, do you have any personal practices that you take yourself through to help work through that, to yeah, get back to that sort of committed all in place? I think that, um, I mean, it was really powerful for me to have a business coach in 20, hmm. uh, I guess it was 2015 and 2017 that I had like for a solid year each time. Nice. Like, uh, someone who was really like championing me. And like saying, I, you know, I see you on the cover of Fast Company magazine and just like these like things where I'm just like, I, it's hard for me to see that, yeah. but like. Again, someone that sees you at your highest potential and that lifts you up. Completely. We all need those people. Yeah. 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 So having, uh, her name is J-Love Calderon and it was with a program called Move the Crowd. Okay. Based in New York. And so that was a big jump for me though, to do those programs. And that was, but that was huge to help like build the, the road ahead. Mm, that's awesome. So yeah. having having that support system around you, you would say, is one of the one of the key things that you needed in order to keep going. Yeah, that's true. And then mm-hmm. even after that, I was part of a mastermind group that Jenny Sauerklein run mm-hmm. ran that we called the the World Bridgers Mastermind. So it was all people who use the arts in in business. Yeah, um, and that was also like a really supportive place for me to to like be celebrated and also like having people root me on yeah right and, yeah and if i'm feeling down or feeling doubt mm-hmm. so and it can tell you to keep going yeah no matter what yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so i think that yeah the like mentor figures or the kind of mastermind community mm-hmm. um that's been really helpful for me in that in that level yeah just to know that you're not alone in this yeah <laughs> right others yeah. are others are also in this with you yeah i mean in some ways like we are alone but like we also are surrounded by people that are doing like similar and cool things. So, mm-hmm. but it is. I mean, in some ways, it has been like a. I don't think lonely is the right word, but it's very much like a. I'm doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing this like yeah. <laughs> based on my own self determination, and like it, when I stop doing it, nothing else happens. Right. Um, that was like leading up until two years ago, where I made my first hire. So. And that's, and that's been really powerful to actually start working as a team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To be sort of nurturing other people yeah. as well yeah, that yeah. you've, that, you know, you've been nurtured along the way. So you get, you get to nurture others now. Yeah. 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 Do you, ha- so because you are running a business, um, is it challenging to make sure you maintain that creative spirit and sense of play within yourself? Because a business, you know, for better or worse has to be, has to have structure, has to have processes and a foundation within it. And, you know, I imagine, you know, a good portion of your time is dedicated to that. And so how, how do you make sure to maintain that balance within yourself? So yeah, keeping the playfulness and the creativity at the forefront is super important to me. I, I have people around me that model it well, that I think are, it's important for me to, to be following after, Mm -hmm. but then I mean, one way that I've done it in more recent, like over the last year or something, I've gotten really into just incorporating my own art into my business. And so whenever I'm having meetings with people, I'll draw, I'll draw out our conversation. Or when I go to conferences, I'll draw portraits of the keynote speakers and I'll create visual notes all around all of the workshops and um, pretty much any time I go to like a, mm. some kind of like content driven session or call. Yeah. And So then these art pieces are practical. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, cementing like my memory around learning, but it also is just bringing my, my art continually into my life, like on a day-to-day basis. So that's been really fun. And so I call it illuminated note taking. That is awesome. I love what you said about incorporating your own art into just your, you know, your, the day-to-day of what your life is now, you know, whether you're at a conference or you're having a call with someone. And I think that's just an important, that's a great idea for anyone really in their life. They think, oh, I don't have time to do something creative or do my art or do this or that. Like, what if you just found a creative way to incorporate it into what your day-to-day life is already? 
whatever yeah. that is. I'm, and I'm a big yeah. advocate in just in buying, like taking people to an art store and having them identify some pens that they really like, some colorful pens, um, and then getting a, a cool kit where they can bring those pens with them every single day and incorporating more color into their notebook um, mm. and even like small drawings just in a very accessible way yeah. as a way of just um, shifting how they take notes. Um, yeah. Partly because it is is fun um, and playful, but it also becomes much more memorable. It's it's more fun to show show people and share and yep yep and we we all take notes every day in yep. some way shape or form. Yeah, so. I mean especially like a lot of folks in my circle are going to a lot of workshops and conferences, and it's easy for things to just mm-hmm. kind of just fade away. Oh yeah, or to just you know take notes on your phone, which is fine too, you know. But why not? add some creative flair to it and I, I I even wonder if you know a lot of us commute on the bus you know what if you brought like a sketchbook and sketched instead of you know playing whatever game on your phone you know just incorporate it into your day and make it accessible yeah. make it easy don't make it this like okay I need to have my I need to have an art studio with the perfect light and yeah. all this in order to be creative like that's that's not really a barrier it yes. doesn't have to be yeah um, well, so what does um, a late night art get, walk us through? Paint us a picture of a late night art workshop in terms of how you work with the organization. How does that How does that work? Sure. I mean, so I can just describe. Two days ago, I was in Santa Barbara. Cool. Um, there's a company, um, or there's a team within Google. It's called Google Artificial Intelligence Quantum, and they work on so many words I don't they work, understand. <laughs> they work on quantum computers, um, which I'm still learning. What's a quantum computer? So I'm still learning more about that field. <laughs> They brought together 150 people from around the world who are scientists and industry leaders and professors in this field of quantum computing. Um, this is a really like powerful and super smart like group of folks. Yeah. And um, but the thing is, like, there were people who are still doing their PhD um, who are quite young, and then there were like high level, you know, leaders in the field. And so this. Conference is like a series of very, very like scientific keynotes. Late Night Art was put in on the beginning of the second day of this two-day conference okay. at 8 in the morning. Okay. So they already had a full day together yeah. of all these and the intention, very high-level talks. The intention behind our, our aspect was to is really about cross-pollination and creating an accelerator for potential collaboration between people, which is highly possible. There are people that run their own companies and then people who work inside of research labs at NASA, at MIT. And when they get time together, they find all these intersections with what they're working on and possibilities form really quickly. So late night art, the process is, you know, we have these two long tables. They're covered in drawing paper that's one long roll that's down the whole table, mm-hmm. art supplies. Like a big banquet table, right? Yeah, it's like, like a, it's like kind of looks like mm-hmm. a wedding banquet. Mm-hmm. Or a Harry Potter dining room table. That's They're, another perfect. <laughs> and visual. And it's covered with uh, flowers, and we actually had it this time. It was in a greenhouse. <clears throat> and people arrive. Um, there's great music playing. Oftentimes, people have no idea what they're walking into. Um, they know that it's like some kind of networking, like creative team collaborative experience of some kind yeah at the conference these are all people who are opting in like generally when we work with other teams um they just they just show up because they have to so it's like kind of a different orientation but even still like we're we have uh you know one or two facilitators in this case it was me and forrest stearns who i talked Mm -hmm. about leading this experience and guiding them step by step through a process that's about letting go of judgment um and moving from a place of individual ownership and creation to what does it look like when we are creating something together as this eclectic group of, in this case, it was about 30 people. Mm -hmm. And so I'll ask a question and the whole room will respond using art supplies Mm -hmm. and illustrate their responses. And then there's often an opportunity to share or connect with the person who's across from them. After that, they move one chair to the right and they start to collaborate and create this large, huge uh, art piece together. So it's not really about the art. It's more about the conversation and the connection between each partner. Um, and over time, they let go of uh, this identity, like, I guess, the ego or individual identity and more into a space of like a community or a cohesive group mm-hmm. where they start thinking 
more as a as a collective instead of like just for themselves. Yeah. And so it's it's really like a metaphor for what's possible when you create a really rich environment for collaboration. Mm-hmm. But the questions can range from like what is a question that's keeping you up at night, like that you're grappling with, like within your work or your personal life, and having everyone write down a question and then walk around the room and actually give each other responses and having that be a source of conversation around like really what's going on for you yeah. to like drawing the neighborhood that your partner grew up in mm-hmm. and creating a I visual, a mm-hmm. visual. Um, and I think a big part of late night art is actually putting someone's life experience into a drawing. There's something that's very humanizing that happens when someone sees some aspect of their life um, illustrated on the page. Yeah. Oh, and then how much more connected you are and how much easier it would be to have a conversation about collaborating on a project or a business together after you've humanized each other and after you've connected on a very, you know, fundamental level like that. And that's, it, yeah. that's what late night art help does. It opens people up in a really beautiful way. Yeah. yeah. Gosh. It, and it, Especially in an environment where people have their best foot forward and there's a lot of posturing, mm-hmm. like it's really a uh, helpful experience to let your hair down or like let down that kind of need to be always like a perfect jewel. Um, and it shows people's imperfections, but in like a, in a way that's like, it makes people want to connect with each other instead of, Mm -hmm. um, feeling like they have to just be like, look what I did. And I, yeah, I, I think it's so funny. We almost have it backwards in a lot of ways. We think that by showing up as more perfect or more put together that we will, we will experience more connection, but it's actually the opposite, right? If, if we yeah. show ourselves to be more human and more vulnerable and more real, that is what actually connects us. And yeah, I mean, we have like, it backwards. you know, my girl, Brene Brown, she's like the oh, leader. Oh, yes, Brene. I love, love I you. love it. But it's also like, I think it depends on the environment. So, cause it's hard. It's hard to be vulnerable when no one else is. Of course. And if absolutely. you're the only one, then it's super like isolating oh yeah and And shaming i don't think that it actually leads to you know so it's like how do we create like whole environments for people yes to open to like let down a couple steps Mm -hmm. and so that's what late night art's about so it's like Mm -hmm. creating the environment for everyone to do that Mm -hmm. whereas if one person's on that level like it it's it's really challenging if it's not reciprocated Mm -hmm. creating that safe space for everyone to come together in that way like as safe Mm -hmm. as possible you know i'm always like uh, cautious of saying that this is a safe space because like it may or may not be for certain people you know mm. but trying to create an environment where people feel like held in a certain way is a big part of what I do mm-hmm. and that and that happens through the music and like creating a space where everyone's voices are heard and just um, there's a lot of dyads and where people are speaking one-on-one as opposed yeah. to having a place where people are put on the spot in front of the group mm-hmm. or just having to be a passive listener. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, have you experienced any stories that you can think of right now around specific transformations that you've seen with the groups that you've facilitated? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, yeah. like I said, just two days ago at this conference, um, around quantum computing, there mm-hmm. was one of our participants, He's probably in his 60s. He's from Egypt, um, and now he lives in Vermont. Um, and okay. he is a scientist and works for a huge um, corporation and had a what he considered like a life-changing experience like in the late night art um, workshop hmm. that the question that he asked to the group that was around like what is he keeping him up at night, some of the responses that he got in that he said, uh, put him in this really reflective space um, where he actually received some like huge news right after the workshop that he actually was able to make like a more confident decision around, he said, because of what had happened. So he literally, it was like an altered space that allowed him to make like a huge step in his life. And he said that wouldn't have happened like if it wasn't for the workshop. So he was just saying that like something that we did like allowed him to take this, this really powerful step. Um, and also allowed him to like, you know, when he was young, he studied calligraphy in Egypt and he said that 
and he was able to write um, this beautiful Arabic calligraphy on the table that brought back this whole like wave of like his love for lettering and for fonts and calligraphy that he hadn't thought about in a very long time. So he uh, he we had a beautiful conversation following the event that that really touched mm, me. That gives me chills. It really touched me and it uh. showed me again like kind of reinvigorated me around what are we really doing here is like yeah. we're creating this portal or this possibility for people to tap into mm-hmm. like one is like a deep connection with themselves um more meaningful connection with others but then also to reestablish like what is their relationship to creativity and to like these different aspects of their creative side yeah. and hopefully like opening the door and deepening that yeah and what he i think his experience with sort of going into a reflective place and having this this breakthrough i think play in general can serves that purpose for so many people you know how often do we kind of get into this you know tunnel vision with our life when when we're trying to solve a problem we're trying to figure something out and getting into that reflective space that's that's when the epiphany comes and that's when the breakthrough happens um but if we continue to just kind of muscle our way through our life and not pull back giving yourself the freedom to be able to pull back and i think play can really help you to to do that in whatever way that means to you but what i think what he said is just that's that's super powerful but it's also like the like creating the environments where people can like play or that part of themselves can like come out or being around the people that invite that from us. Cause Mm -hmm. like, I think that so often for me, I end up in spaces where I feel like only like a part of myself is welcome. So it's not like, Mm. it's hard for me to like be fully expressed, you know, Mm. or to like have that wild, like playful childlike part of me in certain environments. And so I'm more and more, it's like, how can I create an environment where people are able to like fully let themselves go and like let that part out, you know? And that's what I imagine is like really like when you're creating a beautiful organizational culture is like, how do we, how do we allow, how do we encourage those like sides of people to come forward? Mm -hmm. What what do you think those are? What are some ideas that we have even for, you know, for that with, with our friends, for example, how can we, create um an environment of play and expressiveness around our friends around our colleagues around our family yeah Um, if you had any wisdom to share around what you've learned with late night art what would be some things that each person could individually do with their communities i think that like the thing is like we are all so like multi-layered and like even we only know our friends in a certain way we only know our family members in a certain way but there's so much more so like I'm trying to think of like fun ways to like actually like tease and bring those other sides of ourselves out to like learn about each other more. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think the arts are the doorway. So like there's a variety of ways to do it, you know, and it depends on like the comfort of like your friend group or your family. But like, for instance, like, like improv is a fascinating doorway into like bringing out sides of people that you would never expect. Yeah. Um, But I also see the same thing with like creative writing or dancing or um visual arts and there's there's a lot of different activities but just like finding some way to bring people into the arts i think is a a way of allowing them to access their multi-layered like magical selves you know Mm -hmm. but uh, something that's like a tenant from the power of hope camp that i'm a part of still which has grown Uh, into this international organization called Partners for Youth Empowerment Global. Like one of the the main tenets are arts are the doorway to our inner life. I love that. And I think that like through the arts, we can express a lot that we can't with just verbal communication Mm -hmm. um, or the normal ways that we hang out with our friends. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think the challenge I have sometimes with some of my friends is that they, they just really don't see themselves uh, they, they they think art is over here and I'm over here. Yeah. You know, we're separate. There's so much distance. How do you lessen that gap? It's, but I think in it's real like, life, how can we do it? Because a lot of people distinguish, like, I'm not an artist. I'm not a creative person. They yeah. they decide that and it's like a safety mechanism. Um, but, which is like valid because there is like some way in which they decided or there was like a traumatic experience around singing or whatever it was, mm-hmm. which all of us have. And it's really easy to be like, I don't do that anymore. But I think like the, 
where I come, like, my belief system is around, like, the arts aren't for a specific group of people. It's really, like, a really important, like, doorway for every one of us to express different aspects of ourselves. And so for people that are very shut down to their creativity in that way, it's like you have to just frame it in a way where it's you're not saying the word dance or you're not saying the word art, but it's like we're just doing this now, you mm -hmm. know, like, and they need a guide who they trust which could be you, Louise, you know, like who's like helping them like access that part of themselves that's really shut down. Mm -hmm. So I think it takes some creativity to figure out how to create that really like accessible space for them to step in, mm -hmm. um, whether it's like around dance or singing or drawing or theater. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's like a lot of cool workshops in San Francisco and around the world that I think are like good, like little starting points for people. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like starting really small and then taking mm -hmm. baby steps towards like larger, like creative acts. Uh huh. Little baby steps. Yeah. Get to get them there. Like, you, yeah, yeah like people need help and they need someone who they trust. Mm -hmm. And they often don't trust, like, especially if it's like a certain community and they see artists as other. Like, right. it's really easy to be like, this is not my people. That's not me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. They, they're, we're, we're different species of humans. <laughs> yeah. Which is what, I mean, what's kind of fascinating with me and a bunch of quantum scientists. Right. Like quantum right. computing, like leaders mm -hmm. is like, there's a, there's kind of an, it's very easy to be like, I'm not one of them and they can see me as like, I'm not, you know, like he's not one of us or like, we're not, we're all not artists mm -hmm. but then like through my process just a couple of days ago there was like this like beautiful like equalizing quality right yeah. right yeah and i think art and play really just back to the beginning of the conversation it just takes us all out of our box and equalizes us and no matter who we are what our backgrounds are and so yeah um i always i mean i just like the people that i trust most i think are the people who are often like on the edge of laughter. So, I mean, I think about like the Dalai Lama mm. or like Desmond Tutu, Desmond Tutu uh. and the two of them together. And just like, uh. you just feel like when you think of the word play, you know, it's like, yeah. And it's such a powerful force in the world. Like these are two like incredibly powerful leaders. Yes. But people who aren't, who like don't have access to play like I don't trust them. <laughs> I, yeah, yo, I know. I feel no. it. Like, it's like I mean, like some people are just more serious, you know. But eh, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sucks for them. <laughs> just kidding. Um, I've never heard it. i never heard it phrased that way. On the edge of laughter. Yeah. Well, yeah. you can see it. You can see it in their face. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. that there. Yes, that is that magical quality in those in those leaders and those ones that we really connect with. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also something about play that feels like the opposite of stress. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's easy to be, it's like the body is tight, like in a state of like kind of anxious, like On stress. Edge, in a negative versus, way. Versus like, yeah, the wild playfulness of like a child. Yeah. Yeah. Like who, they're like the feeling of no worry in the world comes <laughs> to mind. Yeah. Uh -huh. Or uh, someone said um, the opposite of um, play is depression. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which... Pretty, pretty on point, I think. Yeah. Um, well, this was very powerful, and I'm so excited for the work that you're doing in late night art. It's so needed in companies and communities and organizations. And um, yeah, thank you for the work that you're doing. And I'm so excited to just hear about more of the impact that you're making and um, just that you are a living example of what it means to... Um, to live as an artist and to bring that out in others. Thank so, you. Yeah, it's awesome. Any last parting words about play or creativity that you want to share with everyone before we wrap this up? Um, I mean, the quote that I, that I have always resonated with that, that I love mm -hmm. is, if you want to change our culture, throw a better party. And for me, that's, that's in some ways, it's like, what I live by and that's mm. by Rick Ingrassi who's um, a friend of mine and is also um, married to Peggy Taylor who's the founder of Power of Hope one, cool. of, the, one of the co-founders and so throw a better party I'm always thinking about how can I throw a better party how can I throw uh, create an environment that is so like de uh, de alluring or desirable or that people are attracted to that they want 
to shift their way of being or their way of doing things and they want to do things in a different way which is you know deeper connection more playfulness it's fun but we're still learning Mm -hmm. um we're still working it's still a professional environment but we have great music playing there's good food so that's that's kind of like where it's at for me is like how do we create spaces in schools and governments and uh, businesses in our friend groups and our families that are fun and inviting our playful yeah. and creative self but are still rooted in like deep connection and yeah. and and learning and progressing forward as as human beings yeah because yeah, lord knows we need some parties in some of those places that you just mentioned so yeah. governments and businesses you know etc yeah so, yeah you could really yeah. tell <laughs> You could tell really quickly when uh, an environment is lacking play and creativity. Mm, yeah. You see that a lot when you see what's going on in their, yeah. God, in the places, yeah, <laughs> governments and schools right now. For sure. For sure. Well, here's to more parties that you'll be throwing. And thanks for joining us today, Adam. Really, really, really glad we were able to have this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. just keep keep the play going keep it going exactly thank you again for tuning into that conversation with adam rosendahl the ceo and founder of late night art i hope you got some insights from that conversation i know i certainly did and let's get into those takeaways number one play equalizes each other play takes us out of those boxes that we put ourselves in as we grow up and become adults As we grow up, we become more and more separate from each other. Oh, that person is an artist. That person's an entrepreneur. That person's a doctor. And we see more and more of our differences. What I love with what Adam is doing with Late Night Art is he is taking play and the arts to create an equal playing field amongst people in organizations. So whether someone is a CEO, the coordinator, the admin, They are all put into an experience where they must equally contribute, collaborate, and connect with each other. And the late night art workshop helps facilitate that connection. And I can't help but think back to when we were kids, we didn't have those labels, right? We were just a kid. So it was much easier to connect and collaborate and play with each other when we didn't have all those differences and all that separateness. And what I love about what Adam is doing with late night art is that he's taking play and the arts to create an environment where everyone, no matter what their background, what level they are within an organization, they can come together and equally contribute, connect and collaborate with each other. Number two, think back to when you've had your annunciation moments. An annunciation moment is something I learned about from Ted. And this is a moment in your life when you were just overwhelmed by something and the rest of your life was not the same from that point forward. So it could have been when you saw a music video on TV and you thought, okay, I'm going to be a dancer from now on. You went to a baseball game and from that moment forward, you were obsessed with baseball. So we all have those moments in our lives And those moments are such guiding lights for how we should live our life and what we should be looking for. And I love Adam's story about the time he was 13 years old. He went to this camp called the Power of Hope and his heart was just blown wide open from that moment on. He saw the arts as this portal for him to connect with others, people from all backgrounds and all situations, all different races. And he thought from that moment on, this is something I'm going to do. I am going to use the arts. I'm going to work in the arts. I'm going to do something with it. We all have those moments in our lives where we experienced something and it changed us forever. And the challenge is staying with that feeling and not dismissing it and saying, oh, that was just me when I was a kid. I had an obsession with baseball or whatever it was. And now I need to grow up and get over it but an enunciation moment is absolutely something we should pay attention to and how can you use that as a guiding light for how you move forward in your life or how you go after your dreams number three find creativity in your day-to-day and make it super accessible 
Adam is an artist, but he runs a business now, so he has to work at keeping up his own creative practice as well. Adam talked about how when he gets on calls, he'll sometimes draw the notes instead of writing them. I talked about how if you're doing your daily commute on a bus or the metro, you can bring a sketch pad to draw while you're sitting there instead of playing a game on your phone. So there are so many ways to incorporate creativity in a way that's really accessible to your life. So find those ways you can incorporate it in very simple ways to just keep your creativity and keep that playfulness going in your life in a really accessible way. Thank you again for tuning in to another episode of The Recess Life. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Adam Rosendahl. If you haven't already, make sure you are subscribed on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube. If you are enjoying the episode so far, I would love it if you went to iTunes and left a five-star review. And if you have a friend that could use some more play in their life, make sure you share this episode with them. Don't forget to go to TheRecessLife.com for all of the show notes from today's conversation. I share articles and resources that are related to our conversation. And you can also find Adam's contact information and ways to get in touch with him. If you are on Instagram, I would love to connect with you there at The Recess Life. I share tips on how to live a creative, playful life. So make sure you connect with us on there. I'll see you next week for another episode where we get to learn from another creative, playful person about how they make impact in this world. I look forward to seeing you next week on a new episode. And until then, don't forget to get out and play today.